Okay, so let's start. I'll pass this around. Thank you. <coughs> so before we start applying uh, maximum entropy modeling to to concrete examples, I just wanted to say a few more things about it from the thermal point of view. Uh, the first thing is I wanted to give you a, a two simple other examples of maximum entropy. And one of them, actually, you, you, you know very well. So, now imagine you have a system for which you can define an energy function, which is defined by some Hamiltonian. So remember, x is the collective state of my variables. And now, imagine that you want to have a, a distribution of maximum entropy that is consistent with the mean value of the energy, which you call E. And that's a Hamiltonian. So then you know from the formula I derived yesterday that the distribution should take this form. And this beta here is the Lagrange multiplier. That's conjugate to the energy, right? And if you look at this, this is, looks very familiar. This is just the Boltzmann distribution. So in other words, the Boltzmann distribution is the maximum entropy distribution that is consistent with the given value for the free and for the mean energy of the system. So in fact, that's the most that's the example from physics that we're most familiar with. Now another example. It's a simple example just uh, for uh, illustration, really. So let's say you have x, a random variable. And we put, want to put a constraint, a constraint on its mean value that we measure experimentally, let's say, and also its variance. So remember the the variance is just given by this. So in other words, putting a constraint on having a certain value for the variance and the mean is saying the same as having a constraint on the mean and simply the second moment, right? Because this is just the mean squared. Right? Again. I used the formula from yesterday. And what I do is I put exponential, and then I put lambda x plus mu x squared, right? So I just, it's an exponential form with the first moment, second moment, and here just a normalization. Right, but you know that you can rewrite this in the following manner. So it's, what I'm writing here is just a change of parameters. Uh, and if I want to be really careful, Right, so I, I can find a, I can rewrite this form under this form, and there's a simple relationship between x naught and sigma on the one hand, and my lambda and my mu on the other hand, right? And this, this is just to balance out the, the term of order zero. Right, so that you, you only have, you're only left with terms of order one and two. 
Okay? So let me be, let me be explicit. So that there's no possible confusion. I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but it's not that important. And then I can calculate this normalization coefficient because now I recognize simply a Gaussian distribution. <laughs> So again, you can view the Gaussian distribution as the distribution of maximum entropy that satisfies the mean and the variance of a continuous real variable, right? And there are many other examples like this where the simplest distribution you can write down just happens to be that of maximum entropy. Sorry. Yes? No, so let me, let me re-explain this one more time. <coughs> the idea here is that you have Lagrange multipliers that are conjugate to the value of which you want to fix the average. So when you do this exercise, if you want to find a distribution that's consistent with a given value of the mean energy, you need to tune your beta, you need to tune the temperature so that you reach that desired mean energy, right? Again, it's an inverse problem, if you like. Usually what you do is that you fix the temperature, and from the temperature, you will calculate the mean energy, right? Here we want to do the, other, the, the, the opposite. We fix the mean energy, and we back out the temperature, right? But of course, if you can draw a relationship between energy and temperature, and you know, if you can calculate for each temperature the mean energy, you find, I don't know, something like this. Then you can do this inversion simply by taking your energy, reading off the temperature, right? But this is more general. I mean, here there's only a single parameter. But here, what you want to do is that you want to pick lambda and mu so that you satisfy your constraints, right? So now what I'm saying is that is the following, that I have this lambda and mu, and there's, there's an analytical solution to lambda and mu as a function of mean invariance. And to see that, I first do a change of variable, if you like, where I replace lambda and mu by x naught and sigma squared. Right? This is just a, a, this is just a, a change of variable. Okay? Once I have done this change of variable, uh, I recognize that this distribution looks like this as a function of these new parameters, which are simple functions of lambda and mu. And maybe there's, I forgot to say something important, maybe, which is that P of x, which is just this, is simply x naught. Right? This is Gaussian, and then the variance, and again I use Gaussian integration rules, is sigma squared. So in a way, once when I rewrote parameters as a, uh, as a function of, sig of x naught and sigma squared, I've already solved the problem because it, it just so happens that x naught and sigma squared are the mean and the variance of this distribution. Okay, so here the inversion is kind of trivial. I measure, the, I measure the mean, I measure the variance, and then if I want to turn this into lambda and mu, I just use these, these uh, formulas. Okay? 
So this is a, a simple, analytically solvable uh, case. OK, so in the previous lectures, we talked quite a bit about uh, maximum likelihood. And here I introduced a new concept, which is maximum entropy. What's the relationship between these two guys? So in fact, uh, there is a strong one. It's almost equivalent. It's just a, a difference in the formulation of the problem. So let's say that uh, when we did maximum entropy, we, we, we said that the distribution will take this exponential form. the exponential of a linear combination of my observables, right? Uh, I forgot what notation I used. But. And then we say, OK, but you have to tune, and this is what I just said now, you have to tune your lambdas so that you satisfy the constraint, right? So tune or fit, you know, set the ensemble of the lambdas such that the average of the observable under the model is equal to, sorry, so maybe they, I call this k. So this would be my empirical average, and I want my model. So you, you, have, you have this problem to solve, which is the inverse problem. But now let, let's assume that we know that the model will take this form. So we don't invoke max sense, but we just say that we want the model to, to take this form, right? So for instance, if you have a spin system, and you know that the interaction is pairwise, and you know that it satisfies Boltzmann distribution, then you know it will take this exponential form according to Boltzmann law, right? And then we want to look for the parameters that best explain the data, right? And in a sense, really, a maximum likelihood. So what we'll do is that we write the likelihood. It's the probability, remember, of the data given the model parameters. And here, I assume that all my samples are independent of each other. So they all, they're each an independent realization of my random process, which means that I can simply write this likelihood as a product over all the data points that I, that I saw of the probability that this particular data point, given the parameters of my model. But what are the parameters of my model here? is simply these guys, these Lagrange multipliers, right? Once I've written this form, the only thing that's left for me to, to choose is the value of the Lagrange multipliers. Now this, is simply given by this formula, right? This is just the probability of drawing this particular sample for my distribution. So it's simply given by the prob probability of x of that particular configuration. So if I write my log likelihood, which is ultimately very often what I'm interested in is to take the log likelihood because it's additive in my, in my samples, it would be a sum over my samples of the log of this. 
So I will have a sum of minus lambda and also have minus log z. So what if I apply maximum likelihood to this? Maximum likelihood says that I'm, I'm looking for the set of parameters. So in that case, it would be the set of my lambdas. of this log likelihood, right? So what do, I, what do I do when I want to maximize a, you know, a quantity? I take the derivative and I, I ask that the derivative is equal to zero as a function of these parameters. So in practice, I'll just take my log likelihood and I'll take the derivative, let's say, with respect to lambda a, OK? And if I do this, well, I get two terms. The first one will just be minus OA of x. Uh, sorry, um, this is of x m, right? And here we have minus a sum over my samples. And the other one is m times d log z over d lambda alpha. OK? But here, what you see is that you recognize precisely the empirical average up to factor m. So this I will call the average according to the data. So it's the empirical average. All right, so this is the definition. And when I re rewrite things this way, I just have minus m. the average in the data minus d log z okay so I, I still have this to calculate z minus normalization coefficient But this is actually something that in, in, in StatMec we're quite familiar with. Like if we take, we know that if we take derivatives of the free energy with respect to the different parameters of the model, we end up with the average of the conjugate of these variables, right? This is a general uh, feature of, of, uh, of uh, the Boltzmann distribution. It's very easy to prove. If I write d of log z over d, over d lambda a, well, first of all, I can say that this is 1 over z dz over d lambda a. OK? And what is z? z is the sum of all possible configurations of my Boltzmann weight here, right? So that dz over d lambda a, 
I take this derivative, I get a minus sign, and I simply I simply get this. And I put this together. What I recognize here simply the definition of the average of the, observ of the observable OA. Right? I take my a sum of all configurations of my quantity OA with the Boltzmann weight. Okay? You can put the z here if you like, and uh, I simply recognize my p of x here, right? So sum of p of x times the quantity is the average of the quantity. And there's a minus sign, which I forgot. Uh, and here there's a plus sign, sorry, minus sign. So at the end of the day, here this is the, the model average goes here, and this is the data average. So you can see that this derivative, which I want to put to 0 for lambda star, is simply equal to the difference between the data and the model averages. So when they equal to, when I reach the maximum, is when this thing is equal to zero. So at, at this maximum likelihood value of the parameters, I have identi identity, equality between data and model averages. which is exactly the constraint I had for maximum entropy, right? So in other words, if you start from this model, for, model form and you optimize, you maximize the likelihood with, with respect to these parameters, you end up with the maximum entropy distribution. So the two things are really one and the same thing. It's just the justification is different. In one case, you start from the from the observables and you say, I want something of maximum entropy and that gives me this form and then you need to solve, right? And the other one is to say, I want this microscopic form of the, of the distribution and then you still need to solve by maximum likelihood. But at the end of the day, the models are the same 
and uh, the values of the parameters will be the same. Okay, so now I wanted to spend uh, the rest of the lecture uh, talking about some applications of this idea. And uh, by the way, I should uh, maybe give credit to uh, all these maximum entropy ideas were developed by James in 1957. But only recently has it, has it really been, the, the, only recently the, there has been an interest in applying this to uh, biological systems. And uh, as far as I can tell, one, one, one of the most striking recent examples is, uh, is application to neural networks. And specifically, uh, retinal neural networks. So we already talked about the retina. So you already know what it, how it's structured, but let me just remind you. So um, we talked a lot about photoreceptors. This is where light comes in. And then some output current comes out of these photoreceptors, which is then transmitted to bipolar cells, which themselves transmit a signal to ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells, uh, I remind you, are the cells whose axons form the optic nerve. So they're the cells whose activity will then be sent to the rest of the brain. So all we know about the visual world is contained is in ganglion cells. So you have other layers of amacrine and horizontal cells, which uh, function as a horizontal relays in the sense that they make the they make the, these different cells communicate with each other uh, laterally. But one interesting question is, from the moment you, you get the stimulus here to the moment you get this output activity, how can you interpret this output activity, right? So because this is the only thing that, that, that we, the, you know, that the brain sees, it's interesting to understand how the, the neural code, so the, by code I mean uh, input-output relationship between the stimulus and this output activity, how that code is structured. And so you, you can rephrase the problem in the following. Uh, you have an image. And then what you can do is that you can uh, record, actually, the activity of these output cells, the ganglion cells. And these cells, they, the way they communicate is, is not exactly the same way uh, photoreceptors communicate. Photoreceptors, remember, what was coming out was some continuous output current. So ganglion cells function like most neural cells. Uh, they function by uh, having uh, action potentials, or they're also called spikes. And it, it's a stereotypical uh, burst of activity of electrical activity in these cells. Right? So when you record these cells, what you, you can summarize the activity of the cells by, uh, as a function of time. For each cell, whenever there's been, a, there's been a spike, you're going to put a small dot in this diagram. Right? So this will be called a, a spike raster. Um, and this is all you need to know about the activity of these cells, the, 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 what cell spiked and when. So a general question that people have is, what's the relationship between this image of a cat, let's say, and, or a movie, and the neural activity coming out of these cells? Okay. And uh, in the past few years, for the past uh, 15 years or so, it's been possible to actually record many of these cells simultaneously. Right? So, this is done using uh, multi-electrode arrays. So the, the way it works is that the, the, the retina is extracted from the, from the dead animal. I mean, the, the animal is, is killed. Then the eye is taken out and dissected. But the eye is still alive. I mean, it's still working. So the, the neural network is still working. And then one uh, uh, literally scrapes out the retina from the bottom of the eye and then uh, flattens out one flattens out the retina against uh, a glass array. And on this glass, you, you, you microfabricate 
uh, small electrodes that will allow you to record the activity of these cells. And you can do this while projecting light onto the retina itself. So you can actually do this while showing any image you want. And then you can actually record what's coming out in terms of the spikes. Okay, so there's a lot of technology involved in this. This is a recent paper where they, where they explain how they do this from, from, the, from the experimental to the signal processing point of view. But all you need to remember, really, is that there's a way of presenting Im any image you want and then recording the activity uh, of many cells. So by many cells, I mean you, you can really record uh, up to 200 cells at most at the moment with this kind of technology in a dense patch. And, you know, of course, the retina of, uh, th this will be done on, on retinas of vertebrates. So it could be a salaman tiger salamanders, which is uh, an amphibian, or uh, guinea pigs or, or rats, or even monkeys. And in, in all these organisms, of course, there are many more than 200 cells. But if you take 200, you know, these 200 cells that will be recorded from, which are shown here in, uh, in green, in fluorescent green, and in yellow you see the position of the, of the electrodes, uh, you, you basically will focus on a very small patch of your retina, so a very small patch of your visual field, right? And in this very small patch of the visual field, you want to know how cells collectively uh, encode the information. Do you have any question about the, the, the way this, this works? This is the biology part. But. OK, and I just want to point out that, I mean, this retina it does a lot of stuff. It's not simply a pixel map. So it's not like you, know, you, you, you send light somewhere, and then you just see spikes exactly at the position of the ganglion cells where you send the light. The, the retina actually performs some, some processing. It's really a piece of the brain, so it's already doing computations. And so part of the difficulty is that there's no good satisfactory model of how this input-output relationship works. So how do we get from this to maximum entropy? So the, the, the first thing one can do in the analysis is to, so w the, the question was interested in is, is understanding the collective activity of the neurons, right? So to, to build the collective state, the first thing that these people did in 2006, so this is from a paper, uh, which uh, the citation will come later, uh, by Schneidman et al. in 2006, is that you, you take your, your spike raster, so this, this, this is for each cell uh, on the y-axis you have the, and you have a black dot whenever there's a spike, and you cut your time into many small bins, let's say of size 20 milliseconds. And then for each of these bins, you ask whether the, a particular cell did have a spike during that, that time bin or not. And if it did, you put a one, and if it didn't, you put a zero, okay? And then you repeat this for each time bin and you, you, you end up with a binary pattern. So for each time, you can have you have this, uh, this uh, binary word, right? This vertical column is like, that's what comes out of the retina at this particular moment. And you can view it as a binary word. And you have one binary word for each time bin. So, You can view this as if you're interested in the collective activity. You can write this this way. Or if you're more like a physicist and you prefer a spin notation, you can say, you can put a minus one, so you spin down if there was no spike. So you call that a silence. So these are two different conventions, right? And you put a one if there was a spike. So, so now the collective activity of your network, it would just be a configuration of plus one and minus one.
So I changed my notation from x to sigma to make it look more like a spin. Okay. So this is where we, we can use maximum entropy because what we want is we want a model for the probability distribution of these spike, what I would call spike words. So spike words are basically the, they're the words of the code used by the retina to encode visual information. The first thing I want to know is, is really what is the statistics of these words. Right, so I have all my possible words in here in the zero one convention. I just want to know what the statistics are. Uh, R, right? And if I want to do this naively, I will have to record many, 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 many words, and then do the statistics of them, and, and look at the frequency of each possible word. The problem is that there are two to the power n possible words. And let's say when, when n is over the order of even 100, you can see how, how that starts to be a, being a problem, right? And 2 to the n is, is 2 to the 100. That's about 10 to the 30. So it's, it's, it's way too many, right? So there's no experiment in the world where I can really sample all these, all these possible words. So I need to make simplifications, and this is where maximum entropy comes in. So the first thing you can ask is what if I simply constrain max sense by what we call the mean fi firing rate. So the mean firing rate is basically the average of sigma i. Okay? For each i, I just want my model to reproduce the probability that in each time bin, the neuron I will spike. Okay? So we have a spike rate RI, the probability of spiking. So the, the, the average value of this is with probability. Uh, Ri times delta t, I will have a plus one. And with probability one minus Ri delta t, I will have a minus one. Okay, so it, it will just read like this. So delta t is width of my time bin. OK, so constraining the spike rate is exactly the same thing as constraining this mean value. right? And the maximum entropy distribution I have in that case is the one we derived yesterday. is a model, essentially, where each spin is independent, so each neuron is independent of each other, right? Doing the 
experiment, the input to the PVC degradation is constant? Which, uh, yeah, it's a good question. So here, for, for, for these experiments, what they showed to the retina was natural movies. So it's people went into the, the woods to, with a camera to look at things moving around. Uh, so the idea being that in order to really understand what, what dictionary of words the retina uses, you need to show natural stimuli to it. So, so it's, movie, it's, uh, it's a movie, yes. Time. Yeah, yeah, it's changing in time. So this is like averaging uh, on uh, natural imaging, and so it's uh, what is their average response of the nature to this. Uh, if you, I mean, calling it average, it's, it's not really an average because it's, it's really the statistics of the responses. So you don't take an average, you look at the statistics of all possible responses to these natural stimuli. You are doing the, that uh, average there's, is something. There's no, average. there's no average. There's no average except that you, well, in the sense that, okay, let's say you, you, you write some text, right? And when you write some text, you want to know the frequency of each of the words you, you're using, okay? So you, you can't say really you're taking an average. You're just looking at the statistics of your words. So for instance, the, the word the will be the most used, and then that, etc. That's what you want to know here. So you want to know the dictionary of words that it's using. And there's no semantics. And in this analysis, there's also no relationship to the stimulus. Right? When you, you know, of course, when you write language, in the context of what you, want to, what you mean, the grammatical, grammatical structure, will influence the, the frequency of your words, right? But you forget about that, you just want to know about the statistics of the words at the end of the day. Right? So it turns out that if you write on this kind of model, and then what you can do is that you can, you can take a small sub-network, let's say n equal 10. In that case, 2 to the n is not too large. 1024. So in, in that case, it, it, it is, you can actually record the frequency of each of the possible words. So you can actually calculate the empirical frequency, we are called P data. It's the number of times you saw this particular word divided by the total number of, of times. And um, then what you can do is that you can compare this versus the, this uh, distribution here, which I would call P independent in day. And uh, well, I won't show this graph because actually, let me not show this graph. What, 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 you, what you get. This is identity line, and this is in log scale. You get a, a lot of scatter. In particular, there are many. So each point here will be one of these 1024 possibilities, right? And you get a lot of cases where a spike word is actually quite frequent, but it's completely underestimated by the model, right? So this is a clear case of, uh, of correlations between the neurons. The neurons do not act independently of each other. What happens is that some, some tend to spike when others also spike. And this will make the probability of multi-spike patterns, spike words, more likely than you would predict by just taking a product over each of the neurons, as you would do here. So to, to fix this, and this, is, this was the, the work of Schneidman et al. in 2006 in Nature was that they, they said, okay, what if we now also 
put a constraint on the pairwise terms. Okay. In that case, the distribution takes this form, which I already showed yesterday. of a disordered Ising model. So yesterday you actually saw the ferromagnetic Ising model where the, all the J's are constant and all the H's are constant. This is like the fully disordered Ising model. And these are your, your Lagrange multipliers. And what you need to do now is adjust them so that you, your model agrees with the data for both the mean and the correlations of your, of your spikes, okay? And this, in general, is a very difficult question. We don't know how to solve this problem analytically in general, right? We know how to solve it when the JIJs are constant on, on some regular two-dimensional lattice. Already in 3D, we don't, don't know what to do. And we, we have absolutely have no idea when the JIJs are arbitrary, right? So there are many ways of, of solving the problem. One of them is, is to use Monte Carlo. Um, but, but in general, like just on the, on the technical side, so remember, we, you know, the task is the following, that you, you see these, and there's a one-to-one -one mapping between these observables. and your parameters. And so let's say that you, you have a way of solving the direct problem. So the direct problem is this one, that given the parameters, can I calculate the correlation functions? So as I said, that, that's already a hard problem. And for in this case, the only way to do it exactly, well, sum, sum I exactly in a way that really is, prove, is proven to converge, is to do Monte Carlo, right? So you, you have this model. It's like a, a nice uh, spin model. And you just uh, thermalize using a metropolis uh, algorithm. And then from that, you can calculate your, your correlation functions. But the problem is that that's not what you want to do. What you, what you know is these from the data, and you want to infer H and J's. So that's the inverse, right? And the generic way of doing this is to do a, a, a gradient descent algorithm. And the, the, you know, the reason why you can do this is because of this reformulation in terms of maximum likelihood, right? So remember when we wrote down the derivative of our, of our likelihood, we found this, right? And you want to maximize this guy. You want to maximize this function, and here you have the value of its gradient. And the simplest way of uh, simplest algorithm there is to in optimization is called gradient descent. In that case, it would be more like gradient ascent because you want to maximize the likelihood. So right, let me call it gradient ascent. What you do is that you take your parameters lambdas and you update them proportionally to the gradient of the function you're trying to optimize, right, with some parameter epsilon. So, you know, in multidimensional optimization theory, like you're, you're sitting here, your gradient is going that way, so you're moving 
a bit in that direction, and then the direction is moving that way, moving a bit in this direction, etc. Until you you reach the maximum, okay. And so the nice thing here, I mean the nice thing, if you can solve this direct problem, you can actually calculate these values according to the model using, let's say, Monte Carlo or whatever technique you, is your favorite technique for calculating your, your mean observables. And you can compare to the data, and then all you have to do is update your parameters according to this rule, which just becomes this. you compare data to model. Sorry about that. So in practice, this is what they, what they did for this problem. And this is, well, this is the kind of result that one gets. So one you know, gets uh, the, the full matrix J, J of interaction between your neurons, for instance. So you, you can see that it's actually there's very little structure in this. You have some positive and negative terms, so positive and negative interactions. So it's really, it, 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 at, on, upon first inspection, it looks like a spin glass because you, have, uh, you could have frustration. And... Uh, Then on this graph, I just wanted to focus on, on this one. Here, you, uh, it's the, compar the same kind of comparison I was showing on the board. In green, you would have the prediction of the independent model. And in, uh, in, in red, you see the prediction of, uh, here it's called the Ising model, it's what I call the, the pairwise model here. <coughs> right. And these are on, on small groups of 10 neurons. And you can see that while the P1, the independent one, as I was showing here, has, you know, has very poor performance, uh, the red one falls very close to the identity line. And uh, I think we should have a short break now of five minutes. Yes? Yes? What is the second? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So when you should, yeah. Okay. So you're asking about. Um, I mean, I think your question is related to what kind of observables should you, should you pick, and that's a very difficult problem, and I don't really have a solution for this. And in this particular example, I think the simplest thing to you can think of in the beginning was this: you assume that all neurons fire independently. So you should start on having a model like this, and then you need to look at independent variables. Uh, that are not fitted by your model to see whether they're well predicted. Okay, so here in this case it's fairly simple because we we are in a, in a particular case where in fact you maybe didn't didn't need maximum entropy to start with because you can actually um, calculate you can actually construct this quantity which in general you can't. Right. So in that case you can just compare that. But here actually uh, this maybe serves to illustrate the leftmost one. Here, this is a probability distribution of something that's not predicted by either of the two models, that's not fitted by either of the two models, a probability distribution of the total number of spikes. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, it would be this in the plus, plus minus one convention. So that's the total number of spikes in a given time window. And that if, you, if you think about it, this is a high order quantity that's, n that's not fitted. So, sorry, the, the, the probability distribution of this guy is a, is a, is a, is a quantity of, arbitrary, of a very large order that's not fitted by either 
this model or by that model, right? So then you can, it's, a, it's independent, if you like, of what you try to fit. So you can see whether you're doing well on these. And you see that the independent model really fails to explain <coughs> the probability of having spike words with many spikes, right? The, the, the pairwise model, on the other hand, uh, fits it fairly well, right? So this is, so the, the, you, you need to basically uh, play by trial and error. You should first start with the simplest thing. And then you see whether you can explain things you didn't fit, like the like glo typically glo global observables like, such as this one, like total number of spikes. And then if it, if it fails, then you need to add more observables to constrain. That the ch then the choice of exactly what you add, it's a thorny question. And in fact, uh, Matteo Marcelli uh, uh, at the back uh, has been working uh, on this quite a lot to try and understand how you should pick what set of observables, or in other words, what set of uh, yeah, what, what, what set of terms you should add to your exponential family to get the best possible model at minimal cost of complexity of the model. Right? And you said you had a second question? Maybe. Yeah, my uh, second question was, probably I'm wrong, but can you consider the function of the data, data function for A um, in the first case when we have independent variables as the, the, as the average of the vector x and in the second case where uh, we have, do not have independent variables as the con um, uh, covariance between uh, the yeah, no, this, this is what this is. Like, but here, it's, we, we, go the, we, we go the other way around. Like if we, we say that we want to impose the average of sigma. So sigma is x. Huh? It's just different notations for the same thing. And if we, if we impose just the, just the means of sigma, you end up with a, a model of an of independent variable, right? And if you impose the pairwise one, you, you end up with a model of the type Ising, right? But that's to get this form and this form, I mean, just to remind you, but we did this yesterday. This is just uh, independent variables. Here you derive that it's independent from the maximum entropy principle. So if you apply maximum entropy, uh, and while constraining just the average values, you end up with something independent. And that's not so surprising because maximizing entropy is maximizing the randomness. And the in, independent variables are more, are more random than correlated variables. Right? So this is also another motivation for maximum entropy is that you, you, you're not supposed to add more correlations or more interactions than you need to. Right? And uh, maximum entropy is the way to do this mathematically. OK. Other questions? OK, so we're going to have a five minute break, but really five minutes, because then we only have 20 minutes left. <laughs> Start again. After this uh, five times three minute break. Uh, so let me move on to another example. I, I'll skip that. You can ask me. Well, okay, so I, I'll skip that. just want to say that once you have a model like of this form, of this form, like an Ising model or something like this, you have a, you've defined a Hamiltonian for your system, you may want to study it from the physics point of view. And for instance, you may want to see whether there's a phase transition in this problem or this kind of thing. So th this is the kind of thing that uh, uh, my collaborators and I did. And the kind of thing that one can do is calculate a specific heat that you would calculate from these data generate, f from these models that were inferred from the data directly, right? And what you can find is that the specific heat has a peak as a function of, uh, of this temperature. I, I don't want to stay too much on this because I want to talk about another application, which is uh, even more intuitive than the, than the neurons, which is flocking, okay? So flocking is, is something you may have witnessed yourself. Uh, one of the best examples is birds. So when you have a big group of starlings, for instance, as was captured here on the, from, the, from the terminal station in Rome, uh, you see that 
they really fly in a very coordinated manner, all flying in the same direction, right? And you see these, these beautiful uh, motion. And it's not just the birds, uh, the fish do the same thing. Then in that case, it's called uh, schooling, not flocking. Uh, even sheep do the same, then it's not called schooling, it's called herding. Um, but then, you know, it also happens at the at much smaller scale. Like even uh, cells do it. So these are cells in the epithelial sheet, and uh, these are the cells. And here you see this is uh, the, the velocity fields of these cells, and you can see that they show very coordinated motion. And these are big cells from your skin, let's say. But it even happens in bacteria, like the swimming in coli that I was talking about, pro propelled by these motors. Uh, they also tend, to, when they're in big groups like this, they also tend to move in a coordinated manner. Right? So it happens everywhere. And so there's a group in Rome who specialized in, uh, let's skip that, in, in studying this phenomenon. And what, what, in particular, what they've managed to do is to take 3D, precise 3D pictures of big flocks of birds, of starlings, and again, it's from the same place, from the, they, they set up the cameras on the roof of the, of the Rome train station, and they, they, they set up basically two cameras, actually three cameras, but the, the, the general idea is to have at least two cameras to be able to do uh, stereo photography, so you can reconstruct the, the third coordinate by uh, looking at the difference between your two pictures. So this was done by uh, Andrea Cavagna, Irene Giardina, and their group in Rome. And uh, it's, it's actually, there's a difficult part to this, because if you, if you know that this bird <coughs> is the same as this bird, then by, you know, by stereometry, it's very easy to reconstruct the z-coordinate. You don't understand that. You're shaking your head. And, uh... OK, so when you take a photo, you take a 2D picture. So what if you want to take a 3D picture? You need to, it's like when you see in 3D, it's because you have two eyes. Right? So you reconstruct the Z coordinate from the slight difference in angle in between the two images projecting on your two eyes. So you can do the same thing with two cameras. And with, by looking at the difference of angle, you can re reconstitute Z with this simple formula. Right? The problem is that when you look at a flock of birds, there's nothing that looks more like a bird than another bird in the same flock. So w w while this one is very easy to, okay, this one is probably this one, and this one is probably this one, then when you're right in the middle, uh, knowing that this one is actually this one, it, it, it starts to becoming, starts becoming a bit problematic. So they, they've managed, they used the uh, fancy uh, uh, algorithms to, to be able to solve this matching problem, matching two birds in the same. But at the end of the day, what they get is like a three-dimensional reconstruction of all the positions of the birds. And then you take two pictures in, in very close proximity in time, like a tenth of a second away from each other. You can even reconstruct their speeds, right? So you get a big flock, like this here is a big flock of about a thousand birds, and you get actually all the velocities, right? Which are represented by arrows. And what you can see is that um, they really all fly really in the same direction. It's very polarized. So you can measure polarization. This is a measure of polarization. It's equal to one if they all had exactly the same orientation of flight. It's about 95% on that picture. On some others, it's more like 98, 99%. Uh, but it's not just that. It's also that if you look at the fluctuations around the mean, so you look at, at the motion in the center of mass of the entire flock. It's the same thing as, as saying that you look at the difference between the, velocity, the, the orientation of each bird and the mean orientation. And this is what, what's represented on the right here. Then you can see that uh, even these fluctuations are correlated over some sizable uh, length scale. And you can see that we really have essentially two domains. And the, the length scale here is of the same order of magnitude as the entire size of the flock. Now you can quantify this a bit, or you can make this a bit more quantitative by calculating a renormalized correlation function between the orientations of 
two birds as a function of their distance. And you can see that this decays, of course. And at some point, it crosses zero. And this is what you would call your correlation length. So there is a correlation length of about 10 meters in this case. But what's striking is that if you look at different flocks of different sizes, and you plot this, this domain size, uh, xi, as a function of the flock size, you see it falls onto a, 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 it follows a linear relationship. Right, so the, what this suggests is that the correlations are scale-free. So wh why does that mean? It's because when you, when you have a correlation length that's scaled with the size of the system, it means that there's no other natural scale in the system or that the natural scale of the system is much larger than the system size itself. Right? So it's like a finite size, finite size scaling analysis to show that there's no natural correlation scale in this system. So this was shown by uh, Cavagna and Giardina in 2010. And the conclusion they, they, they drew from this was that the order that you observe, the strong polarization you see in these flux, it must be self-organized because of these large correlation functions. Rather than being centralized, you have, if you had centralized commands, where everybody's trying to do the same thing because they get, all get the same stimulus, let's say, or because maybe one bird is telling them what to do, then what you would see is that the fluctuations, so they will all fly in the same direction, but then if you looked at the fluctuations, then they will all be independent of each other. So they, they're all doing the same thing, but they own small error. Here, the fact that the errors are correlated with each other is suggestive that there's some you know, self-organized or emergent behavior. So can we try and understand this? And can we try and understand it using maximum entropy? And here, we'll, we'll follow the same strategy as for neurons, essentially. Uh, what do I want to raise? So, I, I just characterized my birds by the orientation of flight, which is simply the velocities normalized. direction of oh yeah, orientation of bird I. And what I want is that I want a model where I'm constraining the pairwise correlations between these directions, OK? So here I put an arrow because it's really an arrow in three dimensions, right? So it's not the same arrow as I had before. Before, the arrow was over because it was a vector of n dimensions. Here, each bird is characterized by three dimensions. So if I apply my, my rule of maximum entropy, what I get is a model that looks like this. So again, it looks like a bit like a spin model. In fact, you, you can you can view this as some sort of a post potentially disordered Heisenberg model. And here you, you can really see why this, would, this could be a model of alignment if all my j's are positive. Right. If all my j's are positive, this is as if I had a Hamiltonian. So I'm a Hamiltonian here 
will be minus what's in the exponential. If all my jijs are positive, that means that each bird is trying to do the same as, it, as, as, as the others. Because I get, I get negative energy contribution whenever two spins are aligned. So it's exactly what happens in a ferro magnet, like two, two spins that interact with each other want to point in the same direction. Now, once we define things this way, we run into a problem, which is that we cannot measure these, actually. Because what we have in, in, this, in this problem, typically we have one snapshot, snapshot at a time, so we see one configuration of the, of the flock. Right, so we cannot do these averages. So that's kind of a problem for maximum entropy because you need to start from these means to be able to then fit the parameters. Right? And to, to circumvent this problem, we use the, the fact that we assume, and this is quite different from what we assume for neurons, we assume translation, uh, spatial translation invariance. So what this means is that we think that uh, the, the, the rule of interaction of the birds be, with each other doesn't depend on where they are in the flock. Right? We assume translational symmetry, in other words. And to impose this uh, translational symmetry, we would simply uh, make an ansatz for the form of the JIJ. So we say that J can take two values. Either it's one constant J is if small j is one of the first nc neighbors of i. Right? So this, this would be i here in the middle. And here, would I, would, I would have nc equals 6. So the six first neighbors interact. Sorry, i interacts with its six first neighbors. And otherwise, there's simply no interaction. OK? So this way, I really define this, this, this time really a ferro magnet, where I say my, that my two spins, or direction of flight, will interact if they're neighbors. Okay? So this, this is usually a notation for neighbors. And by neighbors, I really mean this if it's one of, of its NC first neighbors. And here I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I started, you see, from N squared or N squared N times N minus one of the two parameters of the order of N squared parameters. But now when I'm down to this, I have two parameters. I have J and I have NC. Okay? So this is the interaction strength. And this is the interaction range. So then the, the game is, is, is the following, is that I have my data, and I will simply use maximum likelihood to find these two parameters given my data. Right? So I just look at one snapshot, and I write down the probability that I, get this, I got this particular snapshot given J and NC. And I maximize this respect to J and NC. Okay? So I take my, the data collected on the roofs of Rome, where I have all my velocities. And you know, given this form of the model, I just optimize over these two guys. Okay? Okay? 
And so it, one does that, one finds that, uh, well, the first thing one, you know, it's, it's what I said before, like once you have a model, you want to check that it actually predicts well some of the observables that you didn't fit directly. So here, one that was not fit directly is the, 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 the entire correlation function as a function of the radius. And uh, you can see that it fits very well. I mean, if you do the maximum entropy, which would be uh, simply this form, uh, it, it agrees very well with the, with the red one. And uh, I mean, it, it may seem contradictory what I just said, because I said I, I constrained the correlation functions in the beginning. And then I'm telling you that this is an independent uh, validation of my fit. And the, the reason is because once I've reduced my parameters in this manner, I can show that this is equivalent to having a maximum entropy model that is constrained by a local index of correlation which is just a single em empirical mean, okay? So really when I'm doing this fit, I'm constraining the value of a local correlation index. And here the interaction range I find from this fitting procedure, I find about one meter, right? So in a way, like you can view this as my fitting procedure makes sure that these points here within one meter are well reproduced by the, uh, do reproduce the data well, but all the rest of the curve could have gone wrong, essentially, right? So it's, a, it's really an independent validation of the model. Uh, so one can look at higher order correlations. So these are clearly not fit by the model, and these agree uh, fairly well as well. And uh, so, you know, the, the kind of thing that one can answer with this kind of analysis is, is things that uh, biologists were, were interested in. Uh, one of them was whether the interaction range followed the so-called metric or topological rule. So let me explain what that means. Um, so metric would mean that each bird interacts with, the, with some other birds within some radius, fixed radius RC around them, right? And so the, the, the consequence of this is that if the bird densifies, if the flock densifies, and sometimes the flock can take different densities, then the number of interacting partners should increase, right? If it takes the interaction range within a given radius. Uh, the alternative hypothesis that people have was that the, the rule is topological. Topological means that it doesn't really care about the absolute distances. It will just count what well, counts. It will just take a fixed number of neighbors, and that's irrespectively of the density. So this is the same flock as here, but here, see, it keeps six interacting partners, whereas in this one, it increases. So in, in one case, if you... So a proxy for the density is the at mean distance between two birds, right? And in one case, the number of uh, interacting partners is just constant irrespective of this density, right? It would be a flat. And in this case, these two quantities here would be exactly linearly related. So what do you think, what do you think birds do? Metric or topological? Okay, I, I hear both. <laughs> so it's easier to know your neighbor, whether you have a neighbor and it's just doing all the distance between your neighbor. Okay. And do, do you have to say something in favor of metric? Uh, 
that is, they follow the one that. But what would that? I mean, the metric means that it would also, you know, if, if there's more and more close, then they'll, they'll take more into account. Right? Okay. So it's not obvious what they should do. What, what they do, it's also not obvious what they should do. People have argued that with the topological rule, it offers more stability and robustness to the flock. Because then if, if the, the flock expands a little bit, if you have a metric rule, some birds will lose neighbors. And in that case, they may not align as well. And in that case, they may be lost to the flock, and you'll be, you get breaking up of the flock. Well, I mean, the size, the size scaling is not really, in a, it's, it's the really the density scaling, right? But the size scaling, as long as the interaction range is finite, then you know, that's not really a problem. You know, all the, the, the Hamiltonian will, will be extensive, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, the answer is topological. If you actually plot, so, you know, you can analyze many different flux, which have many different densities, and then you can look at this, uh, Parameter, this nc to the power, you know, to inverse cubic power, and, um, and you see it's flat, right? And also does not depend on the size of the flock, right? So you might be worried that it might depend on the size of the flock, because remember, the correlation length depends on the size of the flock. In fact, it, it, it depends linearly on the size of the flock, right? So here it's it's really just to come back to that point, you get a long interaction, you like a long correlation range that scales linearly with the size of the flock from a local, purely local interaction range that doesn't, right? So it's exactly a, a prototypical example of emergent behavior in physics is that you get local interactions and it, it doesn't really matter what the, how local they are and what the size is, right? And from that you get global order no matter what the scale is. So this is exactly what you, you, you would predict from the, from the ferromagnetic uh, Heisenberg model, right? You get this long range order. Uh, what else do I want to say about this? Right, so maybe yes. OK. Uh, right now, I just talked about the orientation. So the orientation is like velocity normalized, so it's equal to one. Uh, but in fact, you know, the fact that you, you get this correlation length that scales with the flux size, it's also true if you look at the fluctuations of the, of the modulus of the speed uh, vi. Okay? And that's, that's a bit more surprising, actually. Uh, let me explain why, maybe. In the, um, when you think about the orientation, it's, it's like a, the orientation of the entire flock is a natural symmetry of the system, right? So, it, of course, if you forget the fact that there's gravity and so maybe up and down is not the same as east, west, north, south, but otherwise, you know, we can reasonably assume that there's some invariance in the direction, right? So there's no preferred direction of flight. And when you have a symmetry like this, uh, you may know that Goldstone's theorem predicts that you get scale-free fluctuations. Right? So maybe, in fact, it's, it's something that you would come out of any sort of model that you, will, uh, that you could write down like this in the spirit of physics. But for the, for the models of the speed, it's not clear why you should get scale-free fluctuations. Right? Because while the orientation, the orientation is arbitrary, uh, there's no preferred direction of flight, the velocity cannot be arbitrary. Right? It cannot go out of bounds, right? I mean, you cannot observe this, for instance. So it needs to control its speed somehow also because of physical reasons. So to, to try and understand this, we, we, we wrote down a, a maximum entropy model that was constrained uh, by, by, by something slightly different than this. Now, instead of doing of taking this, we constrain. Sorry. Uh, 
the difference of, of the velocities, right? But this time, not just the orientation, but the, the actual velocities. And we need to add two things. One, the mean velocity. And the second one is the, the second moment of the velocity, right? And if you do this, well, you can show using the same, the same technique of, uh, of maximum entropy as we always do. This is the form of the model that you end up with, right? So here, nij means that i and j are neighbors. If nij is equal to 1, Uh, and it's zero. Otherwise, we call this usually a J sensi matrix. It's what defines the network of interactions. So you get this kind of model. And what I, I won't show this now, but one can show that uh, if you in the in the sum approximation. You can break this down into two parts. One part that actually is, is equivalent to this uh, Heisenberg model, and one part that's completely specific to the speed, to the modulus of the speed. So in other words, the, the orientation and the modulus of the speed decouple from each other, right? And that's only true in the approximation where these quantities here are small. So, but, okay, once we write this, here you can interpret the terms in the, in the following manner. This is like a coordination between neighbors. So this means that each bird is going to be, have a velocity that's as close as possible to its neighbor. So it's trying to, remember this is the energy, so it's trying to minimize the, 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 the difference with its neighbors. And this one is, is just each bird trying to control its, its, uh, its velocity, right? So this is like just a harmonic potential around the preferred speed, V0. And um, you may not rec recognize this at first sight, but This is very similar to, to Landau's model right? that was used for, to explain superconductivity. Because in Landau's model, the Hamiltonian is written in, in, this, in this kind of, uh, in this form. So let me, let me so probably something you've seen in your in your studies. I put a J here, and usually it's it's normalized out. So this is a very, very generic model where you say that the, the order parameter, which depends on the position x, will have a, uh, we, you, you will have this contribution that tells you, it's like a smoothing contribution that tells you that the order parameter and two neighboring points should be similar to each other. So there's a penalty to having a large gradient. And then you have this, uh, this g phi squared, and then as you know, there's a lambda phi 4 that, uh, that's next, right? And the idea of, of this model is that when g crosses 0 is a critical point. So in, in, in general, these are phenomenological, this is a phenomenological model, so you can express G as a function, let's say, of the, of the control parameters of your model, for instance, the temperature, right? And what happens when G goes to zero is that the lambda phi four 
term will take over, and this is where you get a, sec a second order phase transition. So here you see you have a very similar structure. Like think of phi as v, and think of x as the position of your burn, right? So instead of having a continuous a continuum, so a continuous medium, you have birds which are in, in individual entities, but then they're related by a, a network of interactions, which you can view it, you can view this, uh, this network of interaction as your lattice, and then when the lattice space goes to zero, and, or, or you know, otherwise said, when you look at your, bird, at, your, at your flock of birds from a large distance, it would look continuous, right? And so you can see that this term here is very similar to this uh, J term here. So it's like the gradient term. And here you have this G. And so there's no lambda, right? But other than that, it's the same kind of model. And what happens is that you will have a critical point if G goes to zero, right? So when G is negative is when you really need this term, otherwise your theory doesn't, you know, is not normalized. But as long as G is positive, you, you may not need this lambda. And so what we can do is, again, take the, the data and fit the three parameters that we have. Actually, we have four now. We have J, we have G, we have V0, and we have NC. And we can do this, again, using maximum likelihood. And if we do this, we, we find these quantities, and we form the, the, the quantity G. You know, the, you know, what's really important is the ratio respect to the, to the other parameters, we find that it's actually indeed very small. So it looks very much like the system is close to a critical point. And maybe we shouldn't be surprised because you know, I said that the correlations were scale-free. And if we just had a, a, you know, this, this kind of theory without g going to 0, so with a, a positive g, then there's no way you could get these long-range correlation functions. Because you can only get the long-range correlation functions when you're close to a critical point. And from the biological point of view, what's interesting is that you, this G is the parameter that controls, it's like, remember, it's, I, I said this was a harmonic potential. This G sets how flat this uh, harmonic potential is for individual speed control. Right? And if I find that G is very small, that means that individual speed control is very small, actually. So they, it's, a, it's a very flat valley. And in principle, the birds could fly any speed they want, right? But what happens is that if you looked at the fluctuations of the speed, they're actually of the order of 7%, which is very small. And the reason why they're small is because even though the speed control of each individual bird is small, they all listen to their neighbors, which themselves <coughs> you know, listen to their neighbors, and so on and so forth. And so you get an emergent behavior where even though every bird has very little control, they all try to do the same as the, as the others. So they leverage this, this small control they have to end up in a very tight control of the speed. Right? So why is that interesting even from the biological point of view? Is because, to have this, you know, because they could have achieved also even tighter control by having a, a large G, right? having a large uh, control. But if they did that, then the flock would be less flexible, right? The, the idea of this is that when you're close to a critical point, you, you're also more sensitive. So if you put an external perturbation to the flock, like let's say a predator comes in, then the flock would be faster to respond, right? Whereas if everybody is, is really, you know, trying to have a, a very strong individual control, then even if there's a perturbation, they'll try to keep, you know, to that control and, and keep that value and they won't, they won't be very uh, reactive. OK, so let me just, yeah, so this was the idea of the, of the Goldstone modes. This is just to maybe summarize. Uh, this is a picture taken from Wikipedia or the internet or whatever. 
And the idea is that typically in this kind of model, you have a rotational symmetry that's in the direction uh, here it's called pi. It's basically uh, it's the transverse uh, part of the, of the speed. And this, uh, as I said, because there's no preferred direction, is a free direction where uh, there's no resistance in terms of energy. The S part, so S, sorry, uh, it's the wrong notation. But here, here this would be the V part, so the absolute velocity. On the other hand, is up against this harmonic <coughs> potential. Right? So the Goldstone theorem tells you that you should have scale-free in this rotational direction, but you don't necessarily have scale-free in this direction unless G, and therefore the flatness of this uh, Mexican hat, uh, goes to zero. Uh, let me. And let me just, to finish, give a, a third example because it's been a popular application in the past uh, uh, eight years now. It's about sequence modeling. And I, I just briefly gloss over it, so don't worry too much about it. Uh, but the, the idea is the following, just a uh, very quick summary. Is that OK, so, so the problem is, 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 is this, is that imagine that you have, uh, so as you know, proteins are made of amino acids. And so you can describe a protein simply by its sequence of amino acids. And in nature, sometimes you, you find very similar proteins that are in different organisms, or sometimes even in the same organism, but with different versions of it, and very, very, sim very similar functions or very similar structures. And people have, uh, have collected these examples, and, and then they've tried to align them to each other. Right? So this is like the, the kind of things that people get. Uh, each line here is a protein sequence. And each uh, row, each, yeah, each line is a protein sequence. And uh, they, they've aligned their positions with respect to each other so that positions along a, a certain column are homologous from one protein to the next. And the thing to notice is that at each position, you have quite a, a bit of variability, that there's some possible variations in the choice of the amino acid. However, all these proteins uh, will fall pretty much in the same manner, right? So the question people ask themselves is, how do we characterize statistically what's the variability, what's the allowed variability in the composition of these proteins, right? And a key idea is that of course, maybe sometimes two amino acids can have perform more or less the same function. But it, a, a, a key idea is, is also that these variations are correlated across different positions. And the reason is the following is because sometimes during evolution, an amino acid mutated somewhere. And this could only be done by mutating another amino acid in a different position. And, and the, to, 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 to see why that's the case, you have to think of it as some sort of a lock and key uh, behavior. So, maybe I, I can. so let's say that these are your two positions. And physically in a protein, these two positions were close to each other, and they were nicely packed together so that this amino acid here in purple would nicely be complementary to this amino acid here in, 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 uh, in blue. But now imagine that you mutate this amino acid here in orange. So instead of having this uh, triangle shape, it has a, maybe you don't see it here, as a circular shape, right? So basically, they don't, they don't really match anymore, right? It's like you, you, you change the key, you didn't change the lock yet. So from the evolutionary point of view, this, these proteins won't function very well. They'll be uh, cleared out by evolution, right? Because the, the organisms that carry them will be selected against. So that's not good, right? In terms of fit, these, are low, these have low fitness. However, if a second mutation occurs, and the blue one becomes now the green one, so that the green one, again, has the nice complementary shape to the orange one, then this will become viable and again, and this will become fit again, right? So in, in, in this situation, you see that 
this purple guy can turn into the, the red or orange guy here, provided that this second mutation also occurs, right? So it's, it's called uh, uh, compensatory mutations. And the, the consequence of this is that when you look at many, many proteins that evolved and have pretty much the same function, you should see correlations between these two, uh, between these two, the, the composition of amino acids at these two positions. Right? And uh, so what people have proposed is, is to write down a maximum entry model where the, the, the observable that will be constrained are basically the pairwise marginals, or the, the, the pairwise com uh, composition of amino acids at two positions i and j. Right? And if you use this, all these observables, the kind of distribution you end up with looks like, uh, again, like a, phys you know, a statistical physics model, where now uh, si, instead of taking value plus one or minus one or zero and one, et cetera, et cetera, can take one of 20 values, the 20 values that amino acids can take in a protein, right? So it, 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 maybe you've heard about the POST model. It's one of these things that instead of having a spin, you can have Q different colors. So here it's exactly that. You can have Q equals 20, in fact, 21, because you also have alignment gaps. You can have 21 different colors, and then you can have all the possible interaction terms, so it's the maximally disordered POST model. And what people were, you know, the reason why people did this is because they wanted to know in the structure what amino acid interacts with what amino acid, right? And, and, and you don't necessarily know this unless you have structural information about these proteins, which in many cases you don't. So what they wanted to, to, to have is have a, a way to predict who's interacting with, with whom by just looking at the J's here that were large. Right. So if you have a large value of, the, of this interaction parameter J, then it's, it's quite likely that the two amino acids are actually close physically in the physical structure. Right? Because remember, a protein, this is what's called the primary structure, so it's a linear structure, but a protein folds, meaning that it will do turns, and you, know, you can have two positions in a protein that are far on each, from each other on the primary structure, so on the linear structure, which would be closed in 3D, right? And, and you don't know that by just looking at the sequence, right? So you want to predict that. And this offers a way of predicting this, and this is what people did. And using this, 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 this kind of method, using the maximum entropy method, they could actually uh, predict very well here in, in, uh, in, uh, in red the contacts that there were between different amino acids along the sequence, right? And they could do this in a way that, you know, if, if you had instead, in, you know, an important point of the analysis was that if you, instead of, of, of examining the interaction here, you examined the correlations, so these pairwise marginals, then you would do significantly worse in predicting these contacts, these physical contacts. And the reason, again, like you know, from, from physics, shouldn't be surprising to you is that if you have three nodes that interact in this way, right? This guy interacts with this one, A with B, and B with C. But there's no direct interaction between A and C. So A and C may be actually distant in the physical structure, right? However, since A interacts with B, which interacts with C, a and C will be maybe strongly correlated still, right? So if you just looked at the correlation, you'd be maybe led to wrongly conclude that A and C are close to each other, whereas they, whereas they actually interact only through B. And by, by doing this kind of analysis, you, you unpack basically the interaction network from the correlations, right? So that, therefore, you, you will get the J's directly and this would be the correct measure for contacts. OK, so I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Uh, tomorrow we have the, the exam. It's a multiple choice. Uh, it's designed to be very easy if you followed the course and if you try to do the, the problems.
Okay. There are 20 questions. Um, 